Okay, about these error bars. Now, when you say an expression like this, the initial point is 3.2 plus minus 0.1. It just gives you an interval. So it tells you that the position of whatever you are studying can be between 3.1 and 3.3 meters. It's just a range. You don't know the exact value because your measuring device, no measurement can give you an exact value. They always give you a range of values. So in this case, the, po the for initial position is between 3.1 meters and 3.3 meters, and the final position is between 5.1 meters and 5.5 meters. So those are the intervals. So if you take the difference, the displacement, the displacement is somewhere between 2.4 meters and 1.8 meters. Again, you have this interval only. You don't know the exact point, you don't know the exact displacement, you only know the range, pop range of values for delta x. Okay, this is the correct answer. Now, any questions on the displacement, the error bars? Okay, we have def defined the average velocity, but that's also usually not what we are interested in. Now, for example, if you are driving a car, if you look at the speedometer, it gives you a number. That's not the average speed. That's the instant, what we call the instantaneous speed. Okay, the instantaneous speed at a given time t is nothing but, let's say, suppose your object at this time t is at this point, let's just denote it by x of t, some function of t, you will be measuring it. And at a very small time afterwards, t plus epsilon, now for example, you measure its position at one second, you measure its position at one plus one second, you calculate the average velocity, average, uh, this is the displacement, the average velocity will be this number divided by this one. Now, to calculate the instantaneous velocity, what you do is you just take this limit. This is what we call the instantaneous velocity. It is the average velocity for a very, very small amount of time. Okay, so it becomes more transparent when we look at some geometrical interpretation. Let's say this is the x, this is the time axis, so we are following an object that's moving in one dimension. So let's say this is x equal to zero, this point is t equal to zero, and x is equal to zero. And let's assume that the, our object starts somewhere from here and makes such a motion. And let's assume that the reference point is, let's say, the table. One, two, and three. Now, in this region, one, can you just show me the region where the object is? I mean, the region, I mean, is it on that, direct, on that direction or on this direction of the table? In region one. Hmm? This is region one. So the positive sense is in that direction again. That is my reference point. So if I want to find the po its position at this time, what I do is I just draw a vertical line and find the point that this vertical line intersects this curve. And from that point, I draw the horizontal line. So if this is, let's say, t initial, this is the position at t initial. So since it is positive, this is the positive sense, and that direction we define as the positive sense, our object is, if this is the reference point, it's somewhere over there. And its position becomes smaller and smaller in magnitude, so that just means that it's getting closer and closer to this point, so it's approaching my reference point, that it's moving in this direction, and so the velocity in this region should be negative. Now let's look at region, well let me divide it further. <coughs> 
This is region 3. This is region 4. OK, in region 2, the position, uh, if you just take the position at this time, draw the vertical, it intersects here. So this is the position of my object, which is a negative number now. Since the position is a negative number, it just tells me this is my uh, reference point, so it's in that direction, somewhere over here, in region 2. Furthermore, is, what's this velocity? Is it moving in this direction or in that direction? Well, it started from here in region 2. At this point, it is right here, so it's moving in that direction. It's getting larger and larger in magnitude, of course, smaller and smaller in value because of the minus sign. So here it is moving, it still has a negative velocity. Now, in this region, region 3, where is it? Okay, it, in region 2, what it does is it started from here, moving in this direction, the negative direction, and then in region 3, okay, this is the, the, uh, the maximum distance it has reached in the negative direction, then it started to move in the, towards the positive direction, but it is still in the negative region, so it's still, I'm still here, it is moving in this direction. At this point, it is again at x equal to zero, and after that one, the position is positive, so it's moving in that direction. So let's just write it down here. In region one, in region position and the velocity, in region one, the position is positive, velocity is negative, in region 2, position is negative, velocity is negative, region 3, position is negative, velocity is positive, and region 4, velocity, position is positive, and velocity is positive. Now, the direction of the position of the object and the direction of the velocity of, of the object they are not related with each other. It can be in the positive direction itself, but moving in the negative direction. It can be in the negative direction, but moving in the positive direction. It can be in the negative direction and moving in the negative direction, etc. Now, let's see. Between this point, let's take it to be the point A. No, not that point. Let me take this point over here, point A, and this point, point B. Now, what we would like to do is calculate the average velocity between those two times. Now, let's look at this triangle. So let's just draw a line connecting point B and point A. This is my line. And from point A, let's draw a horizontal line. From point B, let's draw a vertical line. Now, this point is XB. This point over here is XA. This is TA, and this is over here is TB. So we know the time of these events, A and B, the time is TA, the time of B is TB, and we also know the positions at the time TA and TB. Now we have defined the average velocity. We average, or sometimes we will also you show it using this bar on top. This is no, I, we didn't yet come to the tangent. What was the definition? We will show that it is the tangent. Displacement over delta x over delta t. So the average will be xb minus xa divided by tb minus ta. So what is this height over here?
this height. It is just this one plus this one. So is it XA plus XP, right? So this is XA plus XP. Any objections? So you are saying that, so this is XA minus XP, but we are adding So minus xa plus xp? No. No. Absolute value. Okay, so absolute value of xa plus the absolute absolute value of xp. But this is nothing but xp minus xa. Because xa is a negative number, so its absolute value is minus xa. So in terms of as a distance, let's say, if you want to have obtain this distance, okay, this distance is xp minus xa. So this angle over here, this distance is xp minus xa, it is this one over here. What about this length? This length over here. This whole distance is TB, the distance up to here is TA, so the difference is TB minus TA. So if you look at this triangle over here, this length over here is XB minus XA, and this length over here is TB minus TA. So if you define this angle to be theta, this is theta. The average velocity is nothing but tangent of theta. OK, let's do another example. Let me choose my points A and B. Change them. Okay, this is my point, let's say A, this is my point B. And again, I will just consider this triangle. And the horizontal lines. Okay, so what is this length? TA minus TB. Okay, what about this length over here? Minus 6A minus 6B. A minus six B. Without the absolute value. X B minus six A. Why? Why X B minus six A? Okay, so you are saying that okay. 
at least it will be the absolute value of xp plus the absolute value of xa, which is nothing but xp is positive xp minus xa. Like so this is the answer. But since this is positive, both this one is correct and this one is correct. Yes, that is the next point. You see, average velocity is xa minus xb divided by ta minus tb. It is not xb minus xa. So we would like to, I mean, we don't want to worry about these minus signs all the time whenever we are writing the equation, and we don't want to be assuming, okay, if xp is positive or x, x, if xa is negative, we have a plus over here, a minus over there, we want to get rid of all of them. That's one of the things that we are trying to do. I think the easiest thing would be to think of the slope. Yep. Well, you see, here again, this is the average. Look at this angle over here. Or rather than that angle, look at this angle. Rather than looking at this angle. Now this V average is still tangent theta. Well let's call it this thing theta prime. As long as you define this angle to be with this horizontal line going in the positive sense and okay so you just draw this line connecting these two points and you just measure this angle the average velocity will always be this tangent theta prime now you can also you could have also defined it as this angle but any angle that goes below this horizontal line will be a negative angle those are, again, just like in the one-dimensional motion, to, to determine the direction, we chose, okay, this is plus, this is plus, this is minus. We do the same thing for the angles. If, if you have, let's say, this is the horizontal axis the, in the positive direction, if you go above it, we call it positive angles. If you go below it, we call those negative angles, just to determine the direction that you are moving. Now, this is always true. The, the average velocity will be always equal to the slope of this line, which is defined as the tangent of this angle over here. Now, what about the instantaneous velocity? Now, what do we do in the instantaneous velocity, let's say at the time tb, what we should do is just take the second time very close to the initial time, as close as possible. So you just take this point A and move it this time, let's say, TA, and move it closer and closer to the time TB. But if you do that, this, this line will just become very close to the tangent of this curve. So let me plot it again. Okay, if you choose this point B, not over there, but very close to the point A, and if you draw the line that goes through both of them, this, this is nothing but, this is very close to the, almost, the tangent. To the line. This is just a geometrical way of interpreting the instantaneous velocity and uh, the average velocity. Now, any questions on these? Now, the next, next thing we would like to have is to be able to go the other way around. You see, here we, we assume that we measure the position at any, every time and we calculated the velocity. But let's assume that we know the velocity at every time. How can we calculate the position at any time. So let's just start with a, probably the most simple example that you can think of. 
motion with constant velocity. Let's just call it v0. It is constant. Since the velocity is constant, but its average will also be constant, the average will also be equal to v0. So whatever time interval you imagine, the average velocity within that time interval will always be the same. Well, let's assume that we know its position at time t0. At some other time t, its position, let's say it's t, x of t at time t. So this is the definition of the average velocity. This is at time, the position at time t0. This is the position and time at time t. This is the displacement over the time it takes to for this displacement. So this should be equal to the average velocity of my object between t equal to 0 and t equal to t. But, but that average velocity is nothing but v0. So we, from here, we already know that x of t minus x0 is equal to v0 times t minus t0, and x of t is equal to x0 plus v0 times t minus t0. Yeah, it also makes sense because when we were defining the velocity, we said that the velocity is the displacement per unit time. So in a time interval t minus t0, the total displacement will be the velocity, that is the displacement per unit time, multiplied by the total time. That gives you the total displacement and this is where it started from. So you started from here, you add the displacement, you obtain the final position of the object. Now, any questions on this one? Oh, that will be a big claim that everybody knows it. Well, okay, just look at the information content. What kind of information do you get when somebody tells you that, okay, the speed of this car is 50 kilometers per hour? Well, you know that whether in that direction, in that direction, in that direction, in any direction, it can go for 50 kilometers per hour. That is the speed. Now, if somebody tells you the velocity of the car is 50 kilometers per hour, so what he says is grammatically correct, but it's just nonsense. 50 kilometers per hour cannot be the velocity. But if he wants to tell you the velocity of a car, he has to tell you that, well, for example, it is going at 50 kilometers per hour towards the north. That can be a velocity, because you know the direction and you know the magnitude. That is the main difference between speed and velocity. But if you want to buy a car, you would, rather, you would like to know its maximum speed because you can just drive it in whichever direction you want and so it will have different velocities in different directions. Now the velocity contains more information than speed. Other questions about it? I mean the velocity and speed gets quite confusing especially because in Turkish we don't have two different words for those things. Sometimes we say it is the uh, vector output, but I don't know how much it corresponds. There is no single word for velocity in Turkish, unfortunately. Uh, when you say, okay, it is going, araba çok suratli gidiyor, that's something we can use. But we cannot say the same thing with velocity. I don't know, I don't like it. No, I don't think it will be accepted in the scientific community also. Okay. Okay, this was kind of the simplest one when we were studying an object at constant velocity. It, there was a huge simplification because if it was it's moving at constant velocity, the average velocity is equal to that constant velocity. But what about if the velocity is changing?
Now we don't know an exp at this until now we don't have an expression for this how to calculate the uh, displacement for a motion with constant velocity. We know the velocity as a function of time. So if you tell me, okay, at t equal to one second, what is the velocity? I can tell you the velocity. But from this information, how can we calculate the displacement? Now, the, this is a common trick that we use in physics all the time. So if something is changing and you know the, uh, how to play with it, if it was a constant, so what we do is we just study it at very short inter time intervals. So let's say, let's just assume that this is the velocity as a function of time, how it changes. Now at this time, let's say ti, and at this time, let's call it ti minus 1. There are two very close time intervals. And you see, the change in the velocity almost doesn't exist. The velocity is almost constant. So within this time interval, I can calculate. I can assume that the motion is motion with constant velocity, almost, approximately. And I can use this expression. So the position of my object at time ti will be nothing but its position at a somewhat earlier time plus the velocity at that earlier time or sometime any time in this interval because the velocity is more or less constant times ti minus ti minus 1 the duration of that time so does everybody agree with this? you all agree. Now just to simplify the shorten the expressions, I will just call ti minus ti minus 1. This is, I will show it with this letter. Okay, that is your second Greek alphabet. This is epsilon. And whenever you see epsilon in physics, it is almost always, it denotes a very small quantity. Not always, but almost always. It's a very small quantity. So this is what we have. If we know the time at a given time, if we know its position at a given time, I can calculate its position just at a epsilon second later using this expression. Of course, this one replaced by epsilon. Now, let's assume that I know the position of my object at time, sometime t0. I know its velocity at that time. So I can calculate its position at the next time epsilon seconds afterwards by just the initial position plus the velocity at the initial position times epsilon. This is the velocity times time. So this is its displacement in, in this period. It started from here. So after it is displaced by this much, it, reached, it will reach this point. This is its new position at time t1. Agree? Now, I know its position at time t1. I have already calculated it over here. I'm assuming that I know the velocity at any time. So I know the velocity at that time t1. This will be the displacement of my object starting from t1 up to t1 plus epsilon, which I will just call t2. This is the displacement. This is the initial position. So if I just sum them up, I get the position of my object at time t2. Any questions on this one? Yes. Now, velocity might be changing, but what we are assuming is that within this epsilon interval, it is almost constant. That is our assumption. Of course, it's not exactly true, but approximately true. 
The smaller the epsilon is, the more correct your assumption is. At a smaller time interval, the velocity will be changing even less. Well, I can just keep going. Now I know the point is position at time t2. I know the velocity at time t2. I can calculate its displacement in, in, a, in the interval epsilon, in a time epsilon, and that would give me its position at the next time interval, next time t3. I can continue until I reach its position at, if I know its position at time, let's say, t minus epsilon, I know the velocity at t minus epsilon, multiply by epsilon, this gives me the displacement, and this sum just gives me its position at time t. Step by step, I'm just calculating, I'm just, in a, in a sense, I'm, in time, I'm just following how it, how it changes its position. So if I want to obtain the time t starting from its position at time t0, the only thing I need to do is just sum its displacement throughout this time. Well, just sum them up. Okay, on the left-hand side, I will have x of t1, x of t2, x of t3, x of t4, etc., up to x of t. On the right-hand side, I will have x of t0, x of t1, x of t2, etc., up to x of t minus epsilon, plus the sum of these things. Well, you see, on the left-hand side, I will have x of t1. On the right-hand side, I will have x of t1. They will cancel. On the left-hand side, I have x of t2. On the right-hand side, I have x of t2. This will cancel this one. This will be canceled by this one. So I end up having x of t is equal to x of t0. Now, this still remains over here. Plus the sum of v of ti times epsilon. Of course, ti starts from t0 up to t minus epsilon. Now, at each interval, I just increase time by epsilon. If I have a very small epsilon, there are many terms in this expression that will be many. The smaller the epsilon is, the larger the number of terms in this sum is, but the more accurate my calculation will be. Okay, usually what you do, for example, if you are interested in computational physics, you just leave it over here. The computers can deal with very large number of terms. They can just sum them quite fast, so you can leave it over here. So well, if, you want, if you are a theorist, what you would like to do is, well, this is approximate at this point. This is approximately true. The exact expression would be limit as epsilon goes to zero of that sum. Because, okay, we made the assumption that within this interval, time interval that has a length epsilon, the velocity doesn't change. But for any finite time interval, the velocity can change. The smaller the epsilon is, the more correct our approximation will be, and eventually we would like to take epsilon as small as possible. Now that we want epsilon to go to zero. Of course, if epsilon goes to zero, there are infinitely many terms in this expression. And we, we give this a special name. This limit, we give it a special name and we denote it like this. That's where the integrals come into the game. Now, just not to confuse this t with this t over here, I just gave it a different name. It's just like this ti. Okay, here ti goes from t0 up to t minus epsilon. Well, you see, the lower limit is the minimum value that this ti can take. It is t0. That is the lower limit. The upper limit is the maximum value of ti, the last term in the sum. But when you, if you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, the, the last term in the sum is nothing but t. So that's how I determine these limits of the integration. I'm summing over v, it's this over here, and epsilon is nothing but the changes in my 
steps. Remember, I'm just taking small steps in time, and at every step I'm calculating the new position of my object, and this epsilon is so-called the step size. Now we can say that the epsilon was dt, as it's usually denoted like this, as delta t, okay, your third alphabet Greek letter. This is also delta. Now this is capital delta. This should be okay. Probably I wrote it wrong, but it's the small delta. And so th th this is basically what this D stands for. It's a very small chain, an infinitesimally small change in T. And it's basically this epsilon just becomes this dt prime. This is what we call the integral. And in fact, if you look at the sign of integral, if you take s, if you stretch the ends, it just becomes this sign. Now that's why the sign is like that. It's just a sum. The integral is nothing but a sum. Okay, I don't know how much you remember the integrals from high school. I will not ask you to take complicated integrals. I will not accept, expect that. But at least you should know that whenever you see an integral, you should understand that sum is over there. It's a sum. Of course, I would expect you to know the integrals of, let's say, polynomials, and well, basically the polynomials. Hmm? So if you don't remember integrals, review them. In calculus courses, you will see them probably next semester or towards the end of this semester. But I'm, I will assume that you already have some knowledge of integrals from high school and we will be using them. And if you don't remember anything, the only thing I will be using, at least in the lecture, is the fact that integral is nothing but the sum of infinitely many terms, each of which is zero. So if you look at here, if you take the limit epsilon goes to zero, well, this, what, what you are summing just goes to zero, but your, the number of steps that you have to take to go from t0 to t, it also becomes infinite. So you should know that the integral is nothing but sum of infinitely many zeros. The result turns out to be finite. Any questions? Okay, so we started from position of the object. Now we discussed how to obtain the change in position. Which we describe the change in the position of objects by defining the concept of velocity. Also we will discuss how to go backwards. Now the next thing we can do, okay, we had the position, we discussed how the how to describe the change in position in terms of velocity. Well, the next thing, we can also discuss the change in velocity. The velocity of an object that we observe around us, it also changes. For example, in the previous example of Rahim, what he did was he first had a negative velocity until he reached here. And then when he was going back to his, ch his chair, he had a positive velocity, so that's the motion with changing velocity. Now, the change in velocity, we will describe by what's called acceleration. Well, the definition will be identical. You see, we define the average velocity to be the final position minus the initial position divided by the time at which our object was at the final position minus the time at was that it was in the initial position. That is, its displacement, the change in its position divided by the total length of the time that change in that displacement took place. Now the average acceleration will be defined analogously is the final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by how long it took the change to occur. 
This is what we call the acceleration of the object. And, well, all the relations between velocity and uh, position, that we have analogous relation in terms of the acceleration. So, for example, if we have motion with constant acceleration, Let's say the average acceleration will be nothing but whatever the constant acceleration of our object has. Now we had defined the average acceleration as its velocity at some time. Now this is the, let's say, the average acceleration between the time t0 up to time t. Now whenever you are talking about average values, you always have to talk about in which time interval. If you change the time interval, the average values might change. For example, in the case of the average acceleration, again, if you, if you remember what we did in, with the motion of Rahim. So he had first a positive ex average velocity. So he came here. From the time, from, starting from the time that he left this point, he went back to his... No, uh, from the time that he left his chair and came here, he had a negative average acceleration. And then from the time he left the, the front of the class and went back to his chair, he had a positive average acceleration. But from the time he left his chair until the time he went back to his chair, he had zero average acceleration. Just like that for average acceleration, if you change the time interval over which you are averaging, in general, the, the average acceleration might change. So the average acceleration between the time t0 and t from the definition, we know that it has this, number, this value. This is the definition of average acceleration. But since it is more, the acceleration doesn't change, the average is always the same. So from here, we know that v of t will be its velocity at the initial time plus a0 times t minus t0. Just compare with x of t is equal to x of t0 plus v0 times t minus t0. They look exactly the same because the definitions are analogous. You see? Okay, the velo the, the, uh, instead of velocity here we have the position, instead of the acceleration we have the velocity. Now we are just repeating the definition. Now of course we can define the instantaneous acceleration or most of the time we will just denote it by A of t, the instantaneous acceleration at the time t. Again we look at the velocity at the time t, the velocity at a, at a time very close to t. You calculate the average between these two times and take the limit as the duration of this average goes to zero. So this is how we call define the instantaneous acceleration. And most of the time, whenever we say velocity, we will mean the instantaneous velocity, and whenever we say acceleration, we will mean the instantaneous acceleration. Now, any questions up to this point? Okay, we will review this acceleration thing on Tuesday in the beginning. If you have any questions, you can also ask then. But before you go, do you have any questions? Well, because the instantaneous acceleration, let's say, is the average acceleration for a very, very short amount of time. That is the definition of the instantaneous acceleration. Just like instantaneous velocity is the average velocity for a very, very short amount of time. The lecture isn't over yet. Well, that is how we define the instantaneous quantities. It's related with a single time. Now, for the timing, it's just definition. It just turns out to be useful. Other questions? 
Okay, see you on Thursday. Don't, if you want to try it, don't forget that uh, you can upload a prayer report. Oraya yükleyeceksiniz, oraya yaz, yazacaksınız. Ha, nereye? Ottu klasa. Bana mail hiçbir şey yollamıyorsunuz şu reportlarda. Bana mail de bir şey yolla, oraya yolluyorsunuz, ben oradan bakacağım zaten. Oradan yapıyoruz Yani işte o chapter'ı okuyacaksınız. Ha, chapter. Bir tamam. sayfalık bir özet. Yani pazartesi günkü slaytlara bakarsanız orada var. Tamam hocam. Bu dersten itibaren başlıyor değil mi? Yani. Evet. Şu anda bir tane pre-report verdim size ottu klasta. Onu saymayacağım ama yapsanız da olur, yapmasanız da o size kalmış. Evet, Abdurat'lardan sonra saymaya başlayacağım ben artık. Kaç tane yapmışsınız, kaç tane yapmamışsınız. Yani bir şey sormak istedim. Şurada aralık sardığı anda yani yaklaşık olarak tanjant alıyoruz dediniz. Aralık ama sıfıra bittiği ki... anda tanjant olacak. Yani ama belli ki şu iki noktanın eğimleri aynı değil. Ama yani, yok şimdi e, sonuçta şu, şimdi senin bu şu çizgin yani zaten şey yanlış çizgin şu. zaten Hı. de şimdi B noktasına A'ya gittikçe yaklaşıyorsun zaten tam o noktaya geldiğinde artık tanjantını eşit yani eşit mi kabul ediyoruz? eşit Peki. matematiksel olarak eşit olduğunu ispatlaya da biliyoruz yani şey yine de böyle bir farklılık varmış yok. gibi gözüküyor yok. hani yani eğimlerinde grafiğinde e, bu aralığı sıfıra götürmediğin için götüremediğin için göstermek için orada fark görünüyor ama sıfırı aldığın an Artık hani, teyit Yani şöyle düşün. Sonuçta şunu yapıyorsun sen. Herhangi iki nokta seçtin. O noktalardan geçen doğruyu çizdiğinde senin eğrini iki noktada kesen bir çizgin var. Peki bu, o... Şimdi o iki noktayı yaklaştırıp üst üste bindikleri anda senin eğrini tek noktada kesen bir eğrin var. Bir doğrun var evet, galiba. Evet. O da senin tanjant dediğin şey. Evet. Peki onu hesa- yani o agagi hesaplayabilir miyiz? Hani ne zaman o şey kaybolduğu, eğimin tek olduğu hani Sıfır olduğunda. Ha, daha önce o olabilir mi? Eğrine göre olabilir tabii. O da eğriden eğriye değişecek ama. Epsilon'u tam olarak nerede kullanıyoruz? Orada kullandık işte. Yani çok küçük aralıkları ifade etmek için kullanılıyor. Evet. Ha, yani özel olarak... Yani şey, sen istersen... Arda. Adın ne pardon? Arda. Arda. İstersen A desen. Hı. Fark etme. Tamam. Ama, ama standart işte dediğim yani, gibi. Genel. Herkesin kullandığı gelenekler var. Epsilon işte geleneksel olarak küçük nesneleri göstermek için kullanılır. Tamam. Yani sıfıra götüreceğin nicelikleri hatta göstermek için kullanırsın. Hocam geçen seneki Cihancı'yı da onların çektiler ama... Değil. Değil. Değil. Hocam benim atıklarım bu, bugün açıldı. Geç peyit yaptım da. O sizin de eski dediğiniz materyaller görünüyor. Görünecek. <gülüyor> Bana yollamayacaksın. Önce bir çeviri seçtiğin zaman yine Otlu Class'ta ben şunları çevireceğim diye onu koyacaksın. Çevirileri yaptıktan sonra orada Translated Items var. Oraya ben bunları yaptım diyeceksin. Dönem sonunda ben o, tra- o database'tekilere bakacağım. Direkt öyle Wikipedia'ya paylaşıyorum. Evet. Ben Wikipedia'ya bakacağım. Başka bir yere bakmayacağım. Yani oraya basınca zaten çıkacak orada bir yazı yazabileceğim diye. Yani Pre-Report for Chapter 3 diyor zaten. Siz hangi bölümde doktora yapıyordunuz? Ben IAS'tayım hocam. <gülüyor> yani e, sorun değil ama şöyle diyeyim. Performansına bakacağım. Midtermlerde iyi bir şey geçebilecek gibi bir şey yaparsan tamam, bir sorun değil. Tamam. tamam. Yani yapacak gibi de görünüyor. Kitaptaki o sorular öneriyor Daha doğrusu bütün o çiftlerden sonraki soruları çözmemiz gerekli mi? Gerekli mi? Değil. İyi mi olur? Olur tabii. Hayır, birkaç soru da takıldım mı? Garip geldim. Ha? Şimdi takıldığın yerleri sor. Yani şimdi ideal şartlarda kitabın arkasında olsun başka bir yerde olsun bütün soruları çözebiliyor olman lazım konuyu anladıysan. Çözemediğin bir soru varsa e demek ki tam anlamadığın bir yerler var. 
Onları da soracaksın. Şey, e, arkadaki mesela şeyler, tablolar da ayrı bir çekimler falan gösteriyor mesela unit olarak şey olarak falan. Ondan sonra onlar şeyde göstermediği için onda biraz zorlanıyor. Yani sor işte o şeyde sor mesela o tıklarsa orada soru olarak yaz. Birileri cevap veriyor zaten. Olmadı, yanlış cevap verdiler ya da cevap veren çıkmadı ben cevap vereceğim o zaman. Bir kişi biliyor musunuz hocam bu kodu şifreyi falan nasıl hani sisteme geçirebiliriz? Ney? Bu hani şey var ya verdikleri bir şifre var ya hani kullanabilmek için de yani üzerinden. Kitabı mı? Aynen. Ben onu kullanmıyorum. Bu sorun zorunlu değil. Bu yani bu... Hangisi, hangisi işte, için? Chapter 3 müydü? Chapter 3 için. Yani bu pazara kadar. Yani denemek isterseniz, bir aksilik var, yani nasıl çalışıyor görmek isterseniz deneyin diye. Şey, ha, çünkü add droplardan sonra saymaya başlayacağım. Ondan sonra vay hocam işte ben yüklerken şöyle bir problemim oldu, şu, şunu anlamadım, işte şunu bilmiyordum, onu kabul etmeyeceğim. Abi chapter 3'e geldim, ne kadar sürüyor bu chapter 3'ü ben bilmiyorum. Bak kitabına, kitabına bak öğrenirsin. Yeah. 